What's going on, everyone? Today we are joined by Brother Nuri Muhammad. Now, many of you have been asking what's been going on with Justice or Else, why all the black people went up there at 10, 10, 15, what has came out of it. So Brother Nuri Muhammad is going to answer those questions today. Uh, but we definitely want to thank him for joining us on the show. So thank you, Brother Nuri. Brother Phil, it is uh, my honor and privilege to be on a conscious forum with you, my brother, and uh, we I want you to know on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam that we salute you and applaud you for your effort to have a show uh, like this promoting that which is good and constructive for our people. Thank you, Brother Phil. It's my honor. All right. Well, Brother Nuri, um, you know, doing some research into you a little bit, and it stated that you joined the Nation of Islam at 17 years old. Um, what got you to look at the Nation of Islam at that young of age? Well, in, in all honesty, um, I was, at the time, I was uh, what they would call girlfriending and boyfriending with a young sister. And, uh, you know, of course, I learned later on that after reading all the translations of the Bible and various translations of the Holy Quran that I've never seen the word boyfriend or girlfriend in neither book. So I guess boyfriend and girlfriend is not in the language of God, but his show was in the language of the hood. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had a father who was a sympathizer with the nation, never joined, but always loved the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the minister. And started giving her tapes and books. And every time we talked, all she wanted to talk about was the struggle. And I didn't want to talk about that. I was trying to talk about other stuff. And lo and behold, after a certain amount of time, I start reading message to the black man. And I end up coming into the uh, ranks of the FOI at 17 years of age. And I'm pleased to announce that after I got registered at 17, the sister that introduced me to the teachings was 14. We've been together since we were 14. And she came in a month later, and we've been married now for over 20 years. So you've been married for, you say, over 20 years, correct? In 21 years. 21 years. That's awesome, because a lot of people these days can't be married 21 days or two years. And they, yeah, and I, he was divorced. And I just, uh, yeah, I was blessed. You know, I, I, I learned accidentally on purpose, Brother Phil, that the longevity ingredient for a relationship is friendship. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we've been married since we were 19 years of age and uh, have three children. One is just turned 21 last week. Another one, God willing, 20 in a couple of weeks. And then my youngest is 16. And uh, today uh, I just released by way of positive peer pressure my first book titled Before You Say I Do. It just came out today. So. Uh, it's been something that, uh, you know, I've been thankful to God for and uh, has has been really my, my strength and, and saving grace. I'm thankful to Almighty God Allah that he gave me the kind of wife that when I come home, I don't have my energy zapped from me, but I always get recharged and ready to go out and fight for our people the next day. You know, that's, that is definitely a marking of a good woman because I tell tell other men this. You can stay single and, and food the women if you want to, but for, at least for me, it's great to have a woman who, you know, make you feel like you're 10 feet tall, like you say, re replenish your strength, uh, encourage you to keep going and keep fighting. That's just a marking of just of a great woman. Um, you know, what the world put out there today, the Kim Kardashians, the Amber Wirt Roses of the world, like they are the standard. They are not the standard because those kind of women are not going to do anything great for you at the end of the day. That's right. And, and you don't, you know, when you are, when you are in a real relationship, you, you're in a relationship with someone that you want to be the mother of your children. Mm -hmm. And you want them, sons and daughters, to have somebody in front of them that they're modeling characteristics after. And if you don't want your daughter to be the kind of woman that you are thinking about kicking it with, then maybe you shouldn't be kicking it with that kind of woman. 
Correct, correct. And also, even with the children, we have children so loosely within our community. And I tell a lot of people this. If that man didn't give you his last name, I tell the women, then he should not have no child with you. And I tell men, if you're not willing to give her your last name, That's then you right. should not have children. I think if we just follow that model right there, we can cut you down on, Phil. on all this illegitimacy that we have in our community, which is killing us. It's really and killing us. I, loved, I, I knew I was on the right show. Was, I knew I was on the right show when I heard that. Wait, well, hey, brother, you know we. You we, know, you know, in the NBA, do you watch basketball at all? Do I watch basketball? I mean, yes, with current sir. current NBA, I watch it here and there. Look, well, you know that they have something called the developmental league. Yeah, the D league. Yeah, D league. Mm -hmm. And the, when you're in the D league, you, you you're on the team. They you're not really on the team. You get to wear the colors, but you don't get to wear your you don't get your name on the back of the jersey because you're not officially a part of the team yet. Mm -hmm. The minute that you become officially a part of the team, then they put their team name on your front and allow you to put your name on the back. So any woman that's with a man and he hasn't put his name on you, you're not on the team yet. You're just in the developmental league. You haven't even been recruited. You are, you you not even, you don't have a contract yet. So if, you know if you don't have a contract, then don't be too loyal and don't give up too much until you get your paperwork. Exactly. Now let me let me backtrack to your beginnings within the Nation of Islam. It was stated that within a year's time you moved up to the position of a associate assistant. I'm sorry, minister. Um, what was it about you that made you move up so fast in a year, being such a young man? Well, you, you know what, Brother Phil, to be honest with you, it, it, I never wanted to be uh, in the ministry, and I never in my life thought about being a minister or a teacher or, or, or operating in any capacity of leadership, to be honest. So what happened to me, to be honest, is when I joined the, the nation, my mind was like, man, why come, I'm, I asked my mother, why come you didn't? Tell me this. Why come you didn't buy no final calls? You didn't you didn't why come you didn't school me on swine? How how did how did you live and see the nation all these years and you didn't get some of this to teach me? So I, when I joined the nation, I fell so far behind as it related to the knowledge of God, self, the time and what must be done, and the devil, that I was studying eight, ten, twelve hours a day, and I lived at the mosque my senior year in high school. So by the fact that those that were in leadership seen me studying so much, they assumed that if you're studying this much, you must have an affinity for knowledge. And if you got an affinity for knowledge, maybe you should be teaching it. So Brother Phil, I'm going to tell you what happened to me. It was a Wednesday night, which is like, kind of like in church, what you would call a Bible study. Smaller amount of people come out. They asked me to open up on the rostrum. I've only been in the mosque for three months, and I was only 17 years of age. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I know, sir, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm not, I'm not feeling too good today. I was feeling just fine until they asked me to speak. As soon as they asked me to speak, I immediately got sick. And lo and behold, Sunday came, which is the big day, the main day where everybody's there. And then right before the meeting, the brother that was the minister at the time came to me and said, rumor has it that you were scared to open up on Wednesday. Now, come on, Brother Phil, you know you can't tell no black man he's scared. Mm -hmm. So I was like, no, sir. I wasn't scared. I, I, I wasn't feeling good. He said, well, well, how are you feeling now? And because of my ego mixed with my adrenaline, I opened my mouth. And the words that went forth, and I said, well, I'm, I'm feeling fine. He said, well, good. You own in five minutes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, hold on. Wait, wait a minute. This is the big day. Can, can I just do? No, sir. You own in five minutes. Oh, wow. And I went up there, Brother Phil, spoke for a few minutes, and everybody was standing on their feet and clapping and everything. I was like, man, what is wrong with these people? Mm -hmm. I, I And, I, you know, when I got off, in my mind, I, I, I said, you know what? I did it. Then don't y'all bother me no more. I've already done this. Leave me alone. And lo and behold, 
uh, to be honest, while I was speaking, I heard a voice in my head that said, this is what you're born to do. I tried to ignore that voice and go back just to being uh, a good soldier and realize that in order for me to be the best soldier was for me to, to fulfill my purpose. And they kept putting me up there. And lo and behold, uh, here I am getting ready to go into uh, God willing April of this year will mark 20 years in the ministry. So are you the uh, main minister at Moss number 74? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm the, and I've, that's, I've been here for 20 years now. Since I was 20 years of age, I was made the minister here at the mosque at 20, which goes, you know, which is a great testimony to the kind of leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that he would actually see somebody that young and allow them to take up such a major uh, responsibility. So that's what I do here at our mosque. We've been blessed. We don't just have a religious institution or worship center called a mosque, but we also have attached to it, we have our own uh, K through six school. We also have our own daycare. We also have a restaurant and we have a barber shop and a beauty shop as well, all in one complex. So that is, you know, I kind of tried to manage the management of this operation and then this past year, I've been to 68 cities, Brother Phil, uh, by invitation. I've been blessed um, to, for some reason, people like to hear the way that I teach. And I've been to 68 cities uh, this year in addition to maintaining Mile 74 in Indianapolis. Well, that's very good that you also have, you know, other businesses. You're doing education. You're teaching people, you know, about diet and health and uh, child care. That's awesome. Cause we need to, you know, have that within our community and people who, you know, have a love for the people, a love for God and uh, those sort of things. Now, your position within the Nation of Islam outside of being a minister, are you the person that we need to speak to about all the information that's going on within the nation, correct? Uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, uh, or at least with justice or else. How about that? But, but I have, I have been, uh, I have been authorized and permitted and asked to represent the, uh, justice or else, uh, movement around the country. And I, uh, was one of the, uh, right with the minister, I was going and traveling on his behalf, uh, to beat the war drum, if you will, to get people organized for 10, 10, 15. And I've been the primary person traveling and teaching for the follow-up on the next steps after uh, Justice or Else 10, 10, 15. So that's, that's kind of been what I've been doing. I did, uh, I was on the uh, Hot 97 Ebro in the morning. Yeah, see. Really, really big show. Uh, where we covered the same things. So I've been the primary uh, person that's been traveling and teaching on, on, on justice or else what's next. Brothers and sisters, and I wish you all could see what I could see, but in the street terms, we mob deep today. We mob deep today. And we've come together today on 10, 10, 15 because we are sick and tired of being sick and tired of scrolling down our timeline on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and every other day we see a young black male being murdered by the Blue Klux Klan. I, I said the Blue Klux Klan. And we came today to tell the United States government and all the wicked white oligarchy at the top of the power structure of this world that we love our children the same way you love your children and you cannot kill a man with a bag of Skittles and a tea and get away with it. You cannot kill a man for wearing a hoodie and get away with it. You cannot put your neck or knee, a knees in the neck of a 14-year-old little girl just for swimming while being black and get away with it. We came to tell the whole world that black life matters to us, and we're going to make sure that you know that it matters as well. Many times whenever we talk about the struggle against the power structure, first thing that our critics say is always some self-appointed pro bono, no insurance having defense attorney for white folks that jumps on the table and says, well, you know, black folks are killing black people too. And that's the truth. 
That's why we are fighting a war on two fronts. We came to clash today with white supremacy, but we also are making war with negativity too. Did y'all hear me? A special type of negative that we do to one another. But there's a fundamental difference, brothers and sisters. When Ray Ray kills Tyrone, Tyrone is dead and Ray Ray gets life in prison. But when Officer McGillicuddy kills 19-year-old unarmed Tyrone, he does not go to jail. He gets paid administrative leave. Is that the truth? A GoFundMe account is set up, and the next thing you know, other Confederate minds think like him, donating millions of dollars to him. And he ends up getting a job in a, So we got to stop this kind of madness, brothers and sisters. Now, a lot of people, you know, including my wife and I, went to, you know, just as else. You know, now, personally, we really enjoyed that weekend, both of us. We have seen some things that we haven't seen before. The amount of people that was, you know, unified, just yeah. that, that spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood. We enjoyed that. We like it was like a drug for us, you know, just to yeah. see that. And I like, man, it, do it have to be over with? Because it was like just like a, a, a utopia for us just to see that sort of thing. Because we don't get to see that amount of unity and and, yes, peace right. and everybody greeting each other the right yeah. way. And and it wasn't just black people. We saw you know Hispanic people there. You saw right. uh, you know Indians, the Native Americans. I'm sorry, there. I mean, and I've learned a lot just about their cultures. Especially Native American brothers and sisters. I did not even know about how so much we were connected. That's um, right. But this is the thing. You know, in our lifetime, I've never seen this come together with that kind of a unification, but it's something we can get used to. So let me ask you a question. What really inspired Justice or Else at that moment when Mons Farrakhan said, you know what, Justice or Else, and he went with it? Well, originally, he he taken the theme from his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said that he was sitting with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad watching the march in uh, 63, with Dr. King, and he said, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, look, look at them. They're involved in frivolity. They're out there singing and playing. He said, it should be serious. And he said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad talking, one day I'm going to call a march, and it will be for justice, and we will not leave until we get what we came for. So uh, just as it is with our parents or our senseis or our teachers, there are always seeds that have been dropped on us that as life goes on and circumstances present themselves, they begin to provide water and sunlight for that seed and we come up with what we call an epiphany or an aha moment and the thought that was put in our mind in seed form sometime decades ago comes back up at the forefront of our mind into our consciousness. So what happened, in my humble opinion, is that the seed of marching for justice was already deeply rooted in the brain of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But when Trayvon Martin was killed and George Zimmerman did no time in jail, then that water began to feed that seed. When we seen Mike Brown and Ferguson and we seen Freddie Gray and Walter Scott and Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, and the other 900 that didn't get a hashtag, murdered in the streets wholesale, Brother Phil, by mm -hmm. the Blue Klux Klan. I, I said the Blue Klux Klan, mm -hmm. the new Klan in blue police uniforms. I believe that circumstances watered the seed in the fertile ground of the mind of the minister from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's statement in 63, and he stood and said, let's go back for the 20-year 20, 20 anniversary, and this time we're going for justice. He said when he put the words justice out, he felt the tap on the right side of his head, and he heard the words, or else, and he recited the words, or else. So that is the uh, way that it went down. And, you know, I don't know about you, Brother Phil, but being a person that is a student, servant, and soldier of the minister and has been really trying my best to not just listen to his words but study his way, he seems to be a man that knows 
the voice of God when God is talking uh, versus the voice of somebody else. So I'm saying that to say that God is the one that called for justice or else on 10, 10, 15, and the minister became his vehicle or his vessel by which he made his call through. Thus, we see a glimpse of heaven because that's how it is. You know, scripture says the kingdom of God is within you. Mm -hmm. Well, if the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is within you, then everywhere we go, we should be, leave a little bit of paradise behind. So whenever God calls a thing, heaven is the byproduct of it. And I don't know about you, but that's what I felt. I what? was so happy there, Brother Phil, to look around and I could see, you know, a couple of different classes of people. Some people there were just there to see what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Some people were there and they've been already in their own cities making things happen. And then some people that were there used to make things happen in their city, but they had gotten their spirit broken. And to see the person that never did anything for their people inspired to want to go home and make a change and then see the ones that have been fighting want to go home and fight harder and then the ones that had their spirit broken have their spirit mended and healed and ready to go back to work it was the greatest thing that I had ever seen with my two eyes. Uh, uh, except for that Million Man March in 1995. But that's what I, I think that we were looking at, and I, that's where I believe that the call came from. Okay, now, after Justice or Else, you know, we, we had some critics that wanted to come out, and I, I wanted to ask you a question. The first thing they wanted to say was, what is the R Else? That's the first thing they kept saying. Now, can you tell us what the R Else is? Well, you know, naturally, you know, when, whenever we start hearing the terms or else, you know, you grew up in a traditional black home, you already know what or else is. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is reflect on your own personal history bank. And you remember when you came home and you got that F and your mother said, look, boy, I'm telling you what, I know the next grading period, it, it better not be no Fs on this report card. Did you think what would she say, Brother Phil, or else? Oh, yeah, definitely it was about or else. <laughs> Come on, and, and we sure. clearly, you, you better be in here before them street lights come on mm -hmm. or else. Or else is the second alternative whenever someone does not follow the mandate of the first request. So when the minister said justice, that's mandate request number one. And then he said, or else, that's the second alternative if we don't get the first one. Well, of course, you know, I think it was the great Fred Douglas that said power uh, succeeds nothing without a demand and never has and it never will. Well, I'm telling you, until there is a or else, we're we not going to get no justice. So a lot of people naturally thought or else meant that we was going to burn something up or beat somebody or kill somebody. But the real big or else is not in our hands. It was in the hands of God. However, we too have a portion of the or else as well. I don't know how it is in, in Houston. Is that where you are, Brother Phil? Yes, sir. Tell me if it happens like this in Houston. But every other city that we've gone and polled, every time somebody died in the hood, Every time somebody died, Reverend and them show up and they have prayer vigils. They do that in Houston too? Yeah, there's a lot of times that happens, correct. Everybody comes around, holds hands, lights, mm -hmm. candles, RIP t-shirts, and then and then you and then people pray. I said, man, well, brother Phil, I've been seeing this all my life. But yet people still been dying in the hood. Mm -hmm. I said, either the prayers don't work, or we're saying the wrong thing when we pray. Or we're praying to the wrong God, or maybe D, all of the above. Well, can so I, I, can so I? I said I had to go I, check it out. And when I went, Reverend started off good. He said, Lord, we're asking you to supply the family of so-and-so with a peace that surpasses all understanding. I said, man, I'm, I'm with that. I'm with that. Mm -hmm. And then Reverend starts slipping, Brother Phil. I have my eyes closed like just like right now. 
And then Reverend said, God, we demand of you this day an answer. Why do you allow so much death in our community? Why do you allow so much poverty and want in our community? And you, I don't know if you've been to church before, but whenever somebody starts saying something silly in the prayer, you start opening your eyes, squinting a little bit, mm -hmm. and looking around to see if anybody else realizes that he's tripping. Well, when I looked up, I said, see, that's our problem. We asking God why, but God can say, I was going to ask you the same question. Why do you let so much crime and death take place in your community? After all, I created you in my own image and after my likeness. After all, I breathed into you of my spirit. I gave you power and dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every creeping thing that crawls on the earth. So you go ahead and stop the crime and the violence. So the second phase of or else, Brother Phil, is that we know God has a history of bringing down rain, hail, snow, earthquakes, and judgment and chastisement on any nation that violates the oppressed and never gives them justice. So we know they're getting theirs from God. But we also got a responsibility in this or else too. So phase one was the economic boycott during Christmas. Our mantra was from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Brother Phil, up with Jesus and down with Santa. We said if you won't stop, then we won't shop. No justice for us, then no profits for you. And did you see what happened? Yes, right I did. Right now, 4,000 employees are being laid off at Macy's because of poor Christmas sales. Walmart closing down 260-some stores, 2,000 banks are shutting down in America. Even China said they got hit from poor Christmas sales. They're estimating right now that there was nearly $9 billion shortage for Christmas spending this year. So that was part of our else. That was blow number one. But then we got five other things, too, and we get into that, uh, I guess, as the show goes on. But that was effective. And we are thankful uh, to Almighty God that so many of our people say, you know what, I ain't getting ready to go and fight nobody, beat up nothing, and burn down nothing, but I'm going to engage in a painless sacrifice. I'm going to keep my money to myself. And I'm thankful to God that we had a good white boycott. But now, Brother Phil, after a white boycott, it's time for us to have us a good black boycott where we start spending money with one another. Yeah, what I was wanting to say earlier when you was mentioning about them praying is that the problem is a lot of Christian people, unfortunately, you know, there's a scripture that teach faith without works is dead, and they That's have right. a lot of faith for things, but they don't want to do the works. You know, faith and works go hand in hand to equal the results. Um, and, and that's been the problem for a long time within a lot of uh, Christian churches. And, you know, you talk about the boycott uh, that happened over Christmas break. You know, me and my wife had discussed it and said, you know what? We're going to participate in that. It's, it's a good cause. And do yes, you sir. know that it was extremely liberating to do that? You didn't yeah. have no pressure on you to go, oh, I got to buy this. I got to get to the store. Mm -hmm. I got to do this and a third. Then you know, we start thinking, wait a minute. It's like they're, they program it, programming everybody in this nation to do certain things. Well, you shop for your kids on this day. You love your wife yeah. on Valentine's Day. You Come know, you celebrate the birth of Christ or the death of Christ this day. Like, they have to tell us literally by this calendar what we should do. And we should be able to do that any given day or time. Yeah, they're pimping our love, uh, Brother Phil. Mm -hmm. They're pimping our love. They pimp our love for our children during Christmas. They pimp our love for our spouses during Valentine's Day. They pimp our love for, for our family on birthdays. They pimp our love for our mother on Mother's Day. Father, and, and Hallmark and the mall, all of them getting rich mm -hmm. off of, off of our, our spending. So, you know, right now, one of the biggest problems we have as a people is that we are financing our own destruction. That's correct. We blame the white man for 95% of our problems and still spend 97% of our money with them. We have become, Brother Phil, the leaders in unnecessary spending. Did you know black people practice what they have uh, in the world of psych 
uh, uh, psychiatry now, something called retail therapy. Can you explain, have, can you explain re, it to the listeners what that is? Re, retail therapy means that when a person is emotionally void or educationally void on the inside, then they need things on the outside to make themselves feel like they are something. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I don't feel good unless I got a little white dude on the horse swinging a, a, a polo thing. You know, I don't feel good if I don't have some true religion genes uh, on. And the truth is, Brother Phil, true religion is not pants you use to cover your behind. True religion should be principles you use to cover your mind. We had in the barbershop the other day, you know, the brother came, I was telling this story, you know what the brother came and told me? He said, man, you're right. He said, me and my partner, we were out of town, and we were getting ready to go, go out. And before we went out, we was getting dressed, and my partner realized that he left all his jewelry back at home. He said, you know what my partner did? He didn't even go out that night. He stayed in. And he had somebody overnight ship him his jury. He said, I went to the desk with my partner. When he went and picked up that jury from the front desk, he said that when he grabbed that jury, he put on his necklace, his watch, his ring and whatnot. And when he looked up, he told me, I'm back. He said, he told me, he said, he said, brother, it was almost like Clark Kent had went into the phone booth and came out Superman. Something wrong with us, Brother Phil. Yes, Anytime sir. Anytime that we don't have no self-worth or self-esteem unless we got a jewel on our hand or a jewel on our watch or a jewel around our neck. No, the real jewel shouldn't be what we put on our hand or our neck. The real jewel that gives self-confidence is the jewels of wisdom that we put inside of our head. So retail therapy is going out uh, and spending money to acquire things to add to the outside to cover down for what you don't have on the inside. And they say that the adrenaline rush that's attached to the excitement of shopping and buying something and then putting it on is equal to drugs. Problem is, is that as soon as you get home and start taking the tags off, and you wear it one time, you realize, man, it still didn't work. And guess what? Just like a drug addict, man, maybe I need to go buy something better. Mm -hmm. I didn't spend enough money. So it's madness. So we've become the leaders in unnecessary spending. Unnecessary spending is spending money that you don't have to buy stuff you don't need from people that you don't like to impress people that you don't even know. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening to us. So... The economic boycott taught us a lesson. And did you see what happened at the University of Missouri? Yes, sir. See, a lot of the critics, whenever the minister said that the or else was let's boycott Christmas, it's like, oh, come on, that ain't going to do nothing. But you seen at the University of Missouri when they were dealing with a racist president, you seen people standing outside for weeks with signs, picketing, boycotting, nothing happened. Our brother, Jonathan Butler, on campus, he even went on a hunger strike, Brother Phil, said, I'm not eating until the racist president resigns. They were going to let that brother die. But the minute that them 25 football players said, you know what? We're not going to practice, and we're not going to play no more football until the president resigns. Do you know? That in 36 hours, the president and the chancellor quit? Why? Correct. Because they start calculating the math. They were going to lose one million that first game that was happening in three days. And then they were going to lose $35 million for the season. So I said, well, wait a minute. What, what's the lesson in this? If the University of Mizzou football players times economic withdrawal equals resignation of a racist president of a university, then what if 25 million black people multiply economic withdrawal? That could mean the resignation of white supremacy. So we, we had a lot of fuel for the fire, 
and it was effective. They don't want to talk about it, but they feeling it and they felt it. So that was the big phase of the or else that we had our hands on. Hold so, that dollar. Discipline mm -hmm. your dollar. Up with Jesus, down with Santa. Don't spend nothing until justice comes. I, I definitely, you know, agree with you on that about, you know, Martin Luther King told us that, that we, we don't That's have to, right. uh, you know, Molotov cocktails or, you know, we don't have to destroy nothing or commit crimes. Just hold our money in our pocket. And it's more effective right. when we do it because we are the biggest spenders in America. We only hold our money in our pocket for six hours. And yeah. so we keep so many corporations going in this nation. So when we do that, matter of fact, even the mention of boycott, like I talked about this many times before this really got jumped off and maybe we need to boycott and people in there be like, why? you want to do that? Why you want to hurt businesses? Why, like, wait a minute. You don't even own the business. So what are you talking Come about? Here, talk about us holding our money. Like, we're not saying you can't spend yours. Spend it. We're saying about us holding our money until you treat us right. That's what I'm saying. It's the retail therapy. They don't want to admit it. But see, the less you have on the inside, the more you need on the outside to feel like you are something. So when you start feeding your mind with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, when you start doing things that are the advancement of your emotion, your mind, and your health, then you don't need a whole lot of exterior additions to feel like you're something. Mm -hmm. So the, they, they've already found out, found out in the study of black spending that black people are the most brand loyal people on the planet as consumers. I say, well, why would we be the most loyal to a brand? The reason why Chinese aren't because Chinese is their brand. The reason why the Irish aren't because Irish is their brand. But the reason why black people are loyal to a brand is because we don't have pride in our own brand of being black people. If we had pride in the brand of being black, we wouldn't need the Adidas brand or the Nike brand or the Polo brand or the Gucci brand or the Louis Vuitton brand. We wouldn't need their brand on us. Our brand that God gave us would be sufficient. So that was phase one, economic withdrawal. And now from white boycott, we got to go to black boycott and start circulating our money in our own community. Now you're speaking about these brands. These brands are so disrespectful that even though blacks spend billions of dollars with these people, they don't even have an advertising budget toward the black community. A lot of times, less than two percent. They don't show black people in, in right. Gucci ads, and, and yeah, you know, Adidas and Nike. Yes, they give some endorsement deals to some black athletes. But all these high-end clothes, like you said, True Religion. Uh, some black people go to Abercrombie. That's right. All these different people, right? Mm -hmm. They do not put us on any advertisement and I don't understand that how we loyal like a stray dog to a person feeding them off the street to these companies but yet Man. they don't show us. And you, 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 you're touching something very deep though brother Phil. See the, the uh, side effects of the acceptance of white supremacy is that you become black and inferior. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Knowledge of self is what produces love for self. And when you love yourself, you start doing for yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you are loving yourself because you know yourself and you're doing for yourself, then you are brother feel you are my brother. Base word of brother is other. You are my other self. So whenever you know self, love self and are doing right by yourself, you have to see your other self, your brother, in order for you to be moved to purchase a product when you have that knowledge. Anytime that Abercrombie, anytime that American Eagle, anytime that Gap, anytime that Louis Vuitton, anytime that Prada, anytime that Hill Figure can have all ads with no black people on it, but black people are the number one purchasers of the product, is letting you know that we have no knowledge of self that would produce love for self. In fact, what we're saying is that if knowledge of self produces love for self and love causes you to do for, then whatever you know the most about is what you love the most, and whatever you love is who you're going to do for. Anytime black people will buy white stuff with white advertisers, it's because we know more about white people than we do about ourselves. 
Therefore, deep on a subconscious level, we love them more than we love our own. And therefore, we're doing more for them than we do for ourselves. That's why they are so afraid, Brother Phil, of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, because he teaches all of the dimensions of knowledge of self. One dimension of that being the rich history and legacy of us as a people. Another dimension of that is teaching us the knowledge and history of God and showing us that those characteristics in the supreme being are also human characteristics within us. So when you start teaching black people about black greatness, historically, that gives us confidence. But when you can show that Moses stuck his hand in the bosom of the Lord and it was turned white, that's what Exodus says. Well, if it was turned white, it had to go in black. Abraham went to Egypt. And when he was in Egypt, he was mistaken for being an Egyptian. And Egypt in Greek is Aeptus, which means land of black and burnt skinned people. Well, if G Egypt is black and burnt skin and Abraham was mistakenly one of them, then he must have had some black and burnt skin too. Job said that his skin was black. Solomon said, I am black but comely. Jesus said, I'm of the seed of David. And if Solomon was also of the seed of David, Jesus was a black man. When you start teaching that kind of history of the of black presence in scripture, then you don't just get confidence. You walk away with a new thing. I call it Godfidence. And then when you find out that the kingdom of God is within you, that the kingdom of heaven is within you, Jesus said from his own mouth that I've gone forth to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may also be. He ain't talking about fly, living on a cloud somewhere. He's talking about a certain level of existence, a certain plane of thinking. He's going to be up there and we can be up there with, with him. When we start recognizing we're created in the image and likeness of God, meaning we look like God on the outside and on the inside, then that kind of Godfidence from that knowledge and then confidence that comes from learning about the black inventors and the black rulers of the past causes us to know ourselves to the point where we love ourselves and we'll start doing for ourselves and no company will ever be able to put a product in front of us and be disrespectful to us as a community, but not even honoring our image and we wear them clothes another day in our life. No, brother, that's something wrong. It's deep-rooted self-hatred that causes us to spin in such a foolish way. You know, I, I was stating uh, many times, I, I say this, I say, you know, if you just love, I tell black people, if you just love me like you would love a white man, we'd be great. Because, and I say <laughs> this right why I say that. Because, you know, if I step on your shoe, I'll I, I touch your Jordans, you're going to put a bullet in my head. Come on but, now. But if Dylan Roof go kill your, your, your church, yeah. members, you'll say, I forgive you for you, the bodies even get into the ground. Yeah. Um, and you before know, you even ball, apologize. Yeah, the balls. Yeah, Dylan Roof didn't even ask for apology. No, he uh, didn't. Your balls act a certain way. Oh, well, he's just having a bad day. But if you have a black boss that's acting mm -hmm. the same way, you really give him attitude. You're really trying to get him fired from his job or her fired from her job. It's like well, some of us, some of us as black people are so screwed up. And that's why I tell them, you know, we need to stop thinking like we're still on the plantation because we're not anymore. I mean, they don't, right. they don't tell us how to think. They don't tell us how we should speak. And last night I did a video. Speaking of how they talk about Dr. King so much, telling us you should be like Dr. King. You don't tell us who our heroes should be. If we want yeah. to like Dr. King, that's us. If we want to like Marcus Garvey, that's us. If we want to like right. uh, Nat Turner, that's us. If we, if we we always being micromanaged on yeah. what we should like. And we allow that sort of thing. And that's why I speak to. We have to wake up from that stuff and realize this is not 1716 or 1816. We're now on the plantation. We're free to think for ourselves. That's right. What what fool will let their enemies pick their friends? If you're my enemy, why would I let you pick pick my friends? Because if you're my enemy and you pick my friends, more than likely the friends you pick for me are my enemies in disguise. Notice that they always, Brother Phil, they always try to connect us to dead leaders. The only time that they honor Dr. King is after he was dead. The only time they saluted Malcolm X 
was after he was dead. The only time they allowed Marcus Garvey to be respected was after he was dead because they know that a dead leader cannot demand of us any responsibilities. Then they also know that they have the ability with their revisionists to revise, modify, water down, soften in the streets. We call it stepped on it. They can step on the legacy and, and, and cut it up and turn Martin Luther King into I had a dream. The only thing we know about Malcolm X is by any means necessary. Now these brothers said way more than that. Mm -hmm. And when white people try to get us to be like Dr. King, there's nothing wrong with what they're asking. Problem though, they only want you to be acquainted with the Dr. King from 53 up till 65, but they don't want you and I to be connected to that 66, 67, and 68 Dr. King. Because what we see in the last two years of Dr. King's life and legacy is that he had evolved from being a dreaming integrationist to a wide awake revolutionary. So the minister says study Dr. King, but in specific study the last two years of his speeches and we'll be able to get acquainted to the strongest version of Dr. King. No, they know what they're doing by telling us to go look for the dead. See, they know that in their midst and in our midst right now, there's a living leader that is a living legend. And his name is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You see hey. the courage of Harriet Tubman. You see the articulation of Dr. King. You see the discipline and the strength of Malcolm X. You see the vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You see the economic uh, 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 stewardship of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. You see the intellectual prowess of Fred Douglas and W.E.B. Du Bois. All that's wrapped up inside this one man that's walking among us today. But they want to crucify him alive while constantly connecting us to some dead men and women. No, never let your enemy pick your friends because if your enemy picks your friends, more than likely he's picked friends that are your enemies in disguise. So you mentioned economic boycott. You mentioned black boycott, which is two things. You say you had maybe three more things that was going to had to do with the RLs. What is number three? Well, the, the next thing on the list, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and let's keep in mind this too, uh, Brother Phil, that I was going to call you Dr. Phil. <laughs> you the real Dr. Phil. <laughs> but, Brother Phil, that the minister did not originate all of these decisions as monolithic choices out of his own mind. But being the kind of man that he is, not only did he go through prayer and meditation and his own personal deep understanding of the program of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but he also took input from the great black minds of our people from around the globe to come up with these next steps. The point that was made after the economic withdrawal, he said that we need to take over the educational system in the ghettos of America. Since it's our property tax that built the school, it's our property tax that pay the salary of the teachers, it's our property tax that print the curriculum, then technically all the schools in the hood are our schools and all of the teachers, janitors, principals, and faculty are our employees. So we got a right to have some say so over it. And let's put in that curriculum things that teach black children about people that look like them that accomplished great things in the past. That was another point. Then he also said to us that he wanted us to register to vote. But don't register like we've always been registering. We always either are a member of the Republic clan or the Democrats. I know what I said. It's all politics when it's all done. But register as an independent. 
and let's cast our vote for somebody talking about justice for us and what they are willing to do to get America out of the crosshairs of the judgment of God. Do you know what America's original sin is, Brother Phil? The original sin of the United States of America is the kidnapping of hundreds of millions of black people from Africa, transporting us from Africa to America on a three-month, 9,000-mile journey, murdering 13 million of us on the shores of Africa, another 100 to 200 million in the Middle Passage, and then murdering another 83 million doing slavery. That is the greatest crime against humanity that has ever existed. America has never apologized, never atoned, and never did anything to repair the damage. And because of that, the original sin of America, God's judgment, is on America. So we ain't voting for nobody that ain't talking about justice for us. We're not voting for nobody that's not talking about equal and fair dealing with the children of the slaves. So that, that was the other point. The other point he said for us to do, guess what? He said, when you leave, go and find you a good name, an African name or an Islamic name that means something. And pick it and call yourself by it. Don't go to court and ask them permission to wear it. Pick it and wear it. Give your children names that mean something. Did you know that the Bible says, Brother Phil, in the book of Isaiah, that a good name is well, more valuable than, rubies. than silver, gold, mm -hmm. rubies, mm -hmm. gems? Be because, see, silver and gold is the medium of exchange that you use to trade for something that you want in the world. Mm -hmm. and so it is when our children have names that mean something. When your child has a name that means something, then they exchange their life in this world for what they want. But if we don't give our children names that have inside of their name characteristics of divine, characteristics of strength that inspire them to set goals to match what their name is, then we're going to still be under the bridge and tigers in the woods and, you know, Oprah's on some wind freeze and all that. But we need, you understand what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying. We, we need some names of own. Um, another point he said, Brother Phil, he said, join a local organizing committee in the city that you live in. You can find it by going to the justice or else dot com or just download in your app store on your Android or your iPhone the Justice or Else app. Click on LOC and you'll find the exact location in your city where there are local organizing committees meeting every week or every two weeks to make sure that justice or else is not a march or a moment, but is in fact a movement. We got 136 of them right now, Brother Phil, all over the United States of America, think tanks that are planning, strategizing on how we're going to set goals locally and make sure that justice or else is not a moment, but is in fact a movement. So these are some of the primary next steps and action items that have been presented. And for you and those in the viewing audience, if you listen to these things, have you noticed that whether you are Muslim or Christian or a Jew, you can practice all of these? Have you noticed if you don't have no religion at all, you can still practice these? Have you noticed that you don't have to have a lot of money to practice these principles. All of these principles can be universally applied by all, irregardless of creed, class, color, race, religion, ritual, land, language, or label. And the more of us that participate in making justice or else a movement, not a moment, the more we won't be saying justice or else, but we will actually be the or else that brings justice for our people once and for all. So we make sure we, for the audience, we cover it. So number one was economic 
uh, withdrawal, economic boycott. Number two is a black boycott, supporting black-owned businesses. Um, we have education as being number three, getting more involved with the education, the failing schools, closing schools in, in our community as well. Um, we have about naming our children African names or names that really mean something. I know Jawaka Tima and all them other names that I don't know where y'all get those names from. And then uh, the fight. Yeah, well, you know some of these names that we are naming our children in our community. Because I had my daughter, what about <laughs> my last daughter, 19 months ago. And I, and I feel the same way because I know the scriptures. Your, your, the name that you label your children will mean something. So yeah, uh, we yeah, Come on, well, we got to be bigger than you. Don't name your baby Lexus or Mercedes. Don't yeah. name your baby after no car. Yeah. Then you, get mad at, then you get mad at R. Kelly when he talk about you remind me of my Jeep. And fearless men and women's job is to become the peacemakers in the, the, the ghettos of America. Community patrolling to come in and set up conflict resolution where we can, instead of us, every time we got a disagreement, he said, she said, and then he shot and she's dead. If we can have some mediators in the hood that say, look, call us before you go to war then I guarantee you we'll be able to bring peace in our community. So we need 10,000 fearless men and 10,000 fearless women to go into our communities and stand between blue on black crime. You know what that is. Mm -hmm. But we can't be in there talking about going to war with blue on black crime when at the end of the day, blue only kill black about every two or 3,000 every three years. That's bad. But what's worse is that black kills black. 25,000 of us every three every three years. Mm -hmm. So we got to come between the black on black and the blue on black. We can't send no hashtag Black Lives Matter to the White House and forget to send one to the Trap House too. Mm -hmm. No, sir. No, we cannot be standing outside with signs protesting and going to war with white supremacy and not also go to war with negativity. Correct. I, I know what I said, bro. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know exactly what you said. I said negative. It's negativity is a special type of negative. Only black people know how to do to one another. Mm -hmm. We got to stand in between that. So, those are the six primary action items that, if we practice this day in, day out, week in and week out, we can turn the hood into heaven, the projects into paradise, and we can turn the ghetto into God's kingdom. Try it out and let's see if it'll work. Don't you think, Brother Phil, that that we can come together in general as a people, but in specific as black men, to make sure that our children can get on the bus every morning without having to be meddled with by some pedophile in the neighborhood? Don't you think we can come together and stop that? Oh, sure we can come together and stop Don't that. Don't you think that we can look beyond religious lines and philosophical differences and come together with trash bags and clean up our own neighborhood? We definitely can do some we cleaning. We can do that. Don't you this think that the 10,000 fearless men and women could come into our neighborhood and locate the elderly in the community and find where they are and cut their grass from them, for them, rake their leaves, shovel their snow? Don't you think we can come and deal with the people in the community and make sure that they are not disrespectful so that the elders that are homeowners in our community can walk down the streets without being harassed or robbed? Don't you think we could all agree on these basic uh, principles? And I'm saying that if we began to do these few things in our community as 10,000 fearless men and women, we're going to be able to see the hood become heaven. The ghetto becomes God's kingdom. The projects will become paradise if we go to work and do these things for ourselves. We don't need the police. We don't need the National Guard. We don't need Homeland Security. Now we will be our own Homeland Security and secure our homes. What you think, Bud Phil? Oh, brother, anything we put our minds to as a community, we can do it. I mean, that's just point blank. Unity is, is where it's at. You know, even God right. said that at the Tower of Babel, they all come together on one accord, they could do anything. I mean, we they, they, they won't. They won't be anything that yeah, they could not achieve. Right. And, we, we and they was doing something negative, mm -hmm. and God still said that. Mm -hmm. So imagine if God is saying, even though these fools is in unity 
doing wrong, the fact that they're in unity, they ain't going to be nothing they can't do. Imagine right. how powerful we will be if we came together in unity to do right. Jesus said it like this, whenever there's two or more of you gathered together in my name, there I am also in the midst of thee. Mm -hmm. Well, that was Jesus talking to his disciples, but that's also been the FBI talking to us too. Because you mm -hmm. got to know this, sisters and brothers, the minute that you make up your mind to start practicing operational unity, you can expect that some of the occupants of the operation are going to be sent in by your enemy. Watch those kind of people that are troublemakers, backbiters, gossipers, slanderers, and defamers, and put them in check. And let's not just have unity, but let's have divine unity, and let's have uh, uh, righteousness among us while we are together. And, and we won't be able to just do Tower of Babel. We'll be able to do whatever we want to do if we're together, united for right. All right, Brother Neri, where can people find you at if they want to get into contact with you? The best uh, source, I would say, is NuriMuhammad.com, NuriMuhammad.com, and click on that. Just hit the contact Brother Nuri button and get some message directly to me. Uh, or, of course, you just search my name uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, etc. I, I'm going to have to open up another Facebook page because I've exceeded the limits. But, you know, still, still try to, to get on if you can. Uh, if not, like I said, NuriMuhammad.com, click on Contact Brother Nuri, and I'd be honored to uh, listen to you and learn something, and also honored to share what I've learned from my teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, that may be to help you, your family, or your group. All right, we're definitely going to put that link in the description box. Uh, I'm going to give you just a suggestion, Brother Neri. Create a fan page instead of just a Facebook page. You can do that in the options. I'm pretty sure if you talk to somebody uh, at your mosque, they can help you create a fan page, and that has no limits. People can join. Yeah, I, we, we did that too, Brother Phil. Oh, okay. but people, people like the personal touch. I don't know what it is. I got mm -hmm. one of those too, but it did not get all the people on it like we thought. It uh, people People still want to be able to. You already know how we are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly how you know, it goes. We like to be to say, I'm your friend on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, you make sure you uh, connect with, you know, Brother Neri. I'm pretty sure Brother Neri is going to go to, um, yeah, I don't know, I'm just assuming he's going to go to Savior's Day. In, uh, you know that. Yeah, <laughs> well, I didn't want to assume. But I know if you as long as I'm alive, I'll be there. <laughs> okay. But and, I uh, would suggest this too, Brother Phil, uh, for more information on how you can be actively involved in this justice or else movement. Go to justiceorelse.com or download the Justice or Else app on your phone. Multiple sources of information. Also, next Sunday, there'll be a live address via web of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan coming from Detroit. It's titled Divine Instructions and Commands for 2016 you will be able to get much, much more than these six coming next Sunday. So go to NOI.org, NOI.org, or just sign up for the Justice or Else app. It'll pop up, and you can watch it live right from your telephone next week, Sunday, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. All right. Well, definitely thank Brother Nuri for coming in, sharing uh, with us, letting us know what's been happening with the Justice or Else movement. Um, I hope it answered some of your questions. Make sure you connect with him um, to get more information about what he has going on, also uh, with the Minister Farrakhan that's going on as well. So, right. Brother Nuri, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brother Phil. It was an honor to be on your show. Anytime that you want me, I'll be available. All right. Well, thank you, Brother. Thank you, sir.